last talk before the break. So um, Becky Stex from the University of Michigan going to talk to us about democratizing kidney translational medicine data within Transmart. Frequent presenter here. Welcome again. Okay, I recognize that I am the only thing standing in your way of a nice long coffee break. And so we're going to try to do speed round and gain a little bit of our lost time back. All right. So if uh, if I buzz over something too fast, just find me in the hall after. So uh, hi, thank you uh, for having me here again. Um, let me just make sure my slides are advancing. So I'm here as a representative from the Michigan Kidney Translational Medicine Corps, which is a mouthful. Um, but in essence, what we are is a large lab that's focused on um, translational research in kidney disease. Um, we're almost our own little startup in the university. Um, we have a lot of uh, faculty and staff members. There's about 40 of us um, involving uh, translational research like systems biologists, data wranglers, um, in, uh, bioinformatics folks, project managers, a whole embedded software team that I direct. And uh, there's a lot of focus on, in our group on grabbing a lot of molecular data and trying to reclassify kidney disease in molecular terms. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about why that matters later. Um, but we have, we're very proud of the work we've done. And so far we've even identified, we work a lot with pharma customers to identify a target and then try to help them make a therapy for that target and bring it to market. And that is, it's going well, um, which is really exciting. So uh, one of the things we do in our lab uh, to help uh, with this is set up some, some Transmart instances. These, uh, sometimes we use the Transmart instances within our lab and a lot of times we use them as ways to help others get access to the data that we're working with. So in kidney disease, um, right now it's, there's a strange catch 22 where uh, a biopsy, if you were to get biopsied for kidney disease, it might not make a difference to the clinical care you're going to receive. We might learn things about your biopsy, you know, regarding what's happening in the pathology, but it won't make a difference to the treatment decision because there just aren't that many treatment options. So uh, to have access to biopsies is very, very exciting for kidney disease and um, it's a hot commodity. And we're very fortunate that we have a lot of access to biopsy data. And a lot of times it's in, from a large longitudinal cohort study where some subset of the cohort has been biopsied. So we often try to take that data and put it into a Transmart instance so that it's not just our lab that has access to it. So it's a way that we provide some data sharing as well as the ability for the folks that are, uh, you know, clinician researchers in these cohort studies to be able to, to analyze the data without being a bioinformatics expert. So um, that is what then I'm going to take you through is what these are. So for instance, Neptune stands for the Nephrotic Syndrome Study Network. You're going to find that in kidney disease, we're one of those groups that has the really bad acronyms, right? Where we just pick a random letter from the middle of a word and make that the acronym. We do that a lot. And that's just something I've had to come to terms with. Um, but so Neptune is one of those large cohort studies. There's um, 23 different institutions across the US that are involved in Neptune and one in Canada. And so they have been uh, generating. So, you know, a lot of the folks here in this room are used to kind of EHR data that's semi structured. Right now, for Neptune, it's all very structured. It's case report form. So we have a study coordinator that is actually either mining the EHR or talking with the patient, filling out a questionnaire. So the data that we have is not maybe dirty. Um, and you, there's still plenty of uh, issues we find with centimeters and inches too, but uh, it's a lot more structured and, and, and it's a lot of data for a longitudinal cohort, cohort study, but probably not a lot of data if you're used to EHR data. Um, so what we have done then is put the Neptune uh, longitudinal clinical data along with the molecular data that's being collected into one Transmart instance. Um, here's just a, a screenshot of kind of the as much of the tree as I could make readable and still fit in this slide. And then um, every quarter we get a new update of that clinical data, or maybe we'll get, hey, now a different ancillary group has uh, created, you know, done an RNA-seq experiment, and so now we want to fold that data in. So um, we've got right now 175 users uh, of this instance, mostly clinician researchers. And uh, one of the things, as I said, I'm really, you know, it's exciting that we're giving them access to this data, but it is still not the world's most intuitive interface at first, uh, you know, blush once you get used to it, then you know how to navigate it. So one of the things that I uh, personally offer a lot of times is training sessions, and then we um, spin up little quick start guides. And here's an example of one where, you know, we knew that a lot of our users wanted to do a differential expression analysis. And in Transmart, that's called marker selection. 
but our users never called it marker selection. They called it a diffx. And so for uh, an example of something we did was, A, we changed the, when I say we customized the transport instance, we changed the word marker selection to differential expression. Um, and then we added a little quick start guide where we just showed them, here's exactly what you need to do step-by-step step to run this diffx, because that's what you're going here for. Okay, so now I'm gonna buzz through CureGN, uh, Cure Glomerular Nephropathy. It's another large cohort study. Same thing, I'm just gonna, for time, I'm just gonna go past. Uh, and this is a slightly different project that we have, the Renal Pre-Competitive Consortium. This one's really cool. I know I talked to you about it before, so I won't tell you a lot, but in essence, we, have, we are now working with five pharma companies that are actually working together to try and help accelerate the, th so these are all competitors that all have their own kidney drug development programs that are all trying to find the next best kidney. Uh, there's something called diabetic nephropathy. So the next big kidney diabetes drug, and they're working together with each other and with us facilitating to try and share data so we can identify markers faster. And then once, you know, they can take what they, you know, those markers and do what they will with them, but they understood that that was important to try and accelerate this process by sharing. And so Transmart is another way in which we've enabled that sharing. So uh, that is a variety of dif different disciplines that are part of the consortium. And um, they also, every diabetic nephropathy is something that's very interested interesting to them because it would be a quite lucrative drug if they could come up with one. Um, but a lot of times there's, a, like I mentioned before, not a ton of data on it. And so Transmart was also a way that we could help them get multiple different cohorts together in one place for them to to mine. Um, C probe, I'm not even going to, I'm going to skip over as well. It's another one of those cohort studies. Okay, so th in those instances, the things that, uh, is for these cohort studies, a lot of times what people are using Transmart for, one is just data exploration. And a lot of what we saw, you know, Griffin show earlier today, of just how many patients have this, this and this and this and this. And one of the reasons that they might ask that question in our cohort study is because we have access to biosamples. So they might have an idea for something that they want to study and they want to use our data to study. Their first search might be, are there enough biosamples here that I could even do, ask the question I wanna ask and get ask you for that data. So that's a little bit of what then turns into these ancillary study concepts, that third bullet there is this, um, assembly of uh, information to say, okay, I think this would be a really cool question. Let me do some quick validation. Yes, it looks like it would be interesting to continue going forward. Then they approach the cohort owner to say, can I have access to your data or to a sample so that I can you know, run this analysis? And then what's really cool is that if they do run an analysis, they're required to bring it back to our to the consortium. So then they hand that data back to us and we fold it into the next quarterly release, right? So if somebody ran a little proteomics targeted panel, they run that and you know six months later, they send us back the data and that's now a new piece of data for them to mine in Transmart for everyone to have access to. So it's been really handy. So now I wanna talk a little bit about a new project that um, just spoiler alert, we haven't set this up yet. So everything I'm gonna tell you is this is a pretty new project. Um, and so some of this is aspirational, but uh, okay. The Kidney Precision Medicine Project. So um, I told you a little bit about how there's kind of a catch 22 right now. Uh, there's a lot of times where patients do not get biopsied because it won't make a difference to their clinical care. So why put them through this invasive, dangerous procedure with a vascular organ? Um, and, and also, mouse models are not replicating the, you know, human disease the same way that sometimes it happens in, in other uh, organs. So um, because of that, we, we just don't know a lot about kidneys, which is, which is a bummer. Uh, so uh, the NIH Institute that's related to kidney disease decided that we want to do something about it and put a bunch of money together to fund the Kidney Precision Medicine Project with this idea of getting biopsies. And, um, you know, they have a lot of really great things that would happen if we could get this off the ground, right? If we could biopsy these patients, we could develop an atlas that everyone could use as their point of reference. It would find new you know, therapies because it would identify all of these new pathways. And oh my goodness, imagine it would even get more people interested in nephrology, right? Like the the the, the goals we have for this project are um, ridiculously large, um, but in a good way. Everyone is still not burnt out by it. So, um, so okay, I'm gonna buzz through this uh, really quickly. Sorry, the animation and the Pink Floyd, but just in general, the idea being that we 
grab a lot of data. We can understand the different cells and structures and how they react and which uh, uh, molecular markers are associated with those cells within different states and different types of diseases, see if there's a new molecular categorization of these diseases, and then from there, stratify patients by that and see if there's uh, you know, differences in outcomes. Um, I'm going to skip that analogy as well. That's a busy one. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm doing pretty well, by the way. I've saved you guys about five minutes so far. Um, so one of the big uh, uh, goals of this project is something is an atlas, right? And um, a lot of times when I think of an atlas, it is helpful for me to just think of the Rand McNally atlas. It's a page of maps, right? So in that case, I'm going to translate it to a curated list of if information that you might want. In this case, it's spatial information about kidney cells and kidney structures and the associated molecular information. So, but in general, in KPMP, here's how we've got it set up right now. There are a variety of recruitment sites. There's actually eight different institutions across the US who are responsible for recruiting patients and gathering. We're hoping to try and get three cores uh, from a kidney, which is a bit aggressive. It's probably three uh, when we're lucky and two more commonly. Um, <clears throat> then those cores are going to be distributed across uh, a bunch of tissue interrogation sites that I uh, refer to as the Avengers Initiative, right? So there's a couple metabolomics experts and some proteomics experts and some transfer. So the Avengers of omics integration, um, then it's going to come into a central group that will do a bunch of data integration, eventually serve it up in the Atlas, right? Um, and this is just, again, I'm going to go really quick here, but lots of different data that we're bringing in. Even within transcriptomics, there's four different types of transcriptomics that are being studied of this stuff. So um, what we started to realize is that really this atlas has, um, you probably all in this room have a different idea about what an atlas looks like. The same thing is happening in our project, right? And sometimes what you think this should look like and how you think it should work depends on what type of a, a user you might be, right? So if you are a, a you know, data jockey, you want it to be something where you get access to that raw data and you can go to town. You know, you can take it in your own things and you can put it in R and you do whatever you want with it, right? Well, if you're a pathologist, you want it to be a, a, a stained slide. That's what you want to see. And maybe you want to do some sort of machine learning on those images and find different uh, vectors of, of interest. You know, if you're a clinician, you want it to somehow tell you, what should I do? <laughs> what does my patient have and what do I do about him? And another group that's really, really important in the Kidney Precision Medicine Project is the patients themselves. So we have a lot of patient advocates who are embedded in our committees, come to our face-to-face -face meetings and create a, a lot of our policies and drive a lot of our policies. So one of the reasons that this project actually hasn't officially biopsied anyone yet is because the patient advocates said, you don't get to stick a needle in anyone until you have insurance for this um, you know, at-risk population. And we had to work with the government to find a way to create insurance similar to clinical trial insurance for this research study, which is unprecedented. So um, the patients also have certain things that they want to see in this atlas, and it's very different than probably what a lot of us in this room are thinking about. So what what helped me uh, to when I was trying to figure out how to get my arms around this, um, and I'm just going to skip to the very right hand side of this flow diagram for time, is that really there's a couple, the Atlas is a lot, a couple different tools or major groups of tools. One is this curated list of maps where maybe we have somehow taken data and we have determined here's the spatial layout of the kidney that we want you to look at, and then here we've tied this molecular information into it. Right. Then there's also for those data jockeys, some people just want where are all of your data sets curated, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable in a place that I can go grab. And then there's another group that has been another leg to this stool is, is folks that say, well, I don't I don't know how to grab that data and do anything with it. But I do have questions and I do have questions that I, I don't want you to just curate for me. I want to get to, to ask them myself. Um, and then there's actually a fourth leg of the stool, which is tools specifically for patients. But I'm going to skip that one for a second and say that I want to focus here on data exploration tools because what we're intending. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> Drum roll, please. There is a mouse, just so you know, a mouse. You see that? Okay. So um, <laughs> it's headed that direction. So be, uh, be on the lookout for crumbs. Oh, it's headed here. Here he is. Oh my goodness, how exciting. He must have heard me talking about the model systems. So um, uh, last, last, yeah, right, exactly. He's like, yeah, 
get some human biopsies in here. So last year when I was here, I talked to you a little bit about the software development. I was called Kanban and Kidneys, if you remember it. So I've got this embedded software team and um, we have this user-centered design approach. It's not new in software development world, but one of the things we do is kind of talk about use cases and personas. So we came up with a variety of personas. This mouse is so exciting. Uh, and you guys wanted coffee. Now you're all red. You're in it now. So um, so we have kind of six main personas for that we've identified as people who want the kidney tissue atlas and want different things with it. Um, and so I want to take you through an example, a use case here of a clinician, since this was user use case stories, to tell you that um, this is something that we've heard our clinicians say to us, is that you know, how, well, what will I find out in this biopsy that's going to change the management for my patient? So we can envision them wanting to do something where maybe they search uh, and, and, and try to t take off the veil of an I2B2 or Transmart for just a second and just say, you know, they're going to want to search for different clinical features they have somewhere in some tool, who knows what kind of tool they could use, right? And, and they want to maybe see like, well, what are the diagnoses conventionally for um, for that set of symptoms or uh, descriptors or what, you know, search terms. Um, but they might also then want to see what are the different molecular uh, you know, associations to the search terms I had. And are there any different outcomes to that, right? In essence, that's really what they want to know is what can predict my outcome. And, and what we're gambling on is that a lot of it's going to be molecular data as well as some histopathology. And so, what we're envisioning is um, actually what I haven't told you yet because I was waiting to the acknowledgement slide is one of the other main collaborators on this is the University of Washington. And if you were paying attention to Griffin this morning when he showed you the leaf, those folks are working on KPMP with us as well. So what we're right now toying around with, and I said aspirational, but you know it's maybe a little more than aspirational, is the idea of having a leaf front end with similar to um, you know Transmart, the ability to after you've organized your cohort and found I want to look at this set of samples maybe versus this sam samples that have these features, now run an analysis on that right and run a differential expression. Um, so that's what we are going to be trying to construct is something that kind of has a, the the UI feel of Leaf, so a clinician can go in there and drag and drop different properties from our. Uh, in, in KPMP, we do have a variety. It's going to be lots of structured clinical data from a, a large set of CRFs, as well as some EHR feeds that are coming in slowly. We're not going to do the EHR fire hose, but it's going to start with, hey, let's look at these particular you know, lab tests from EHR. Let's start with those and see if we can consume those in pieces. And so, um, so that's the approach we're intending to take, um, it, but we're still in very early stages. And as you know, from my software development approach, we, want, we like to fail fast. And so we're gonna iterate and see if it's gonna work for us, but that's the, that's the intention. So with that, there's a ton of people that are behind all those pictures I showed you. KPMP especially is a very exciting project with a lot of really great collaborators, especially the ones from the uh, UW for this audience. And um, you know, there's my, my team as well. So um, the, yeah, again, KPMP, that's all the different groups involved. And I'll take a question or two if, if anyone wants to stay in instead of getting coffee. Thank you. The coffee is spoken. <laughs> it's a speed round. So you mentioned that um, you're, you're putting data in the trans market sharing that with particular collaborators. Is that something where they're going and running an instance locally and working with there? No, we set up the instance ourselves and then they, I just provision them with access to it with accounts. So, yeah. And do you, in the context of that, the lockdown data export? Exactly? Yes, yes. Actually, for, for, for many of the, for the, the everything but that renal pre competitive mm -hmm. consortium in, uh, one, we have taken the data export away mm -hmm. because we're, it's uh, just a way to force them to use the consortial policies, which means they have to go ask permission for the data. So the data is still accessible for them to get, but we don't let them get it straight from Transmart because that was the, the kind of the product owner's request to make sure that they're following their procedures of going through the committee to request access. So, mm -hmm. so Catherine, do you know if any of these groups, consortium, I don't know for the KPMP groups. I don't know, Gil. No. So. I was going to say, I assume some of them do, especially, yeah, the recruitment sites are the, were the ones that are trying to get patients. They probably, many of them do. 
So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you are one of them. Yeah. Peter had a question. Oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm happy to share any quick start guides that we've developed. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much.